Suppose you know exactly what you want to ask on your survey. How do you put it all together? What type of layout do you use? How do you choose what order to ask the question in? That's what we're going to look at here. So let's, let's talk about ordering the questions. A good principle is to start with the easy and the interesting, because you don't want people to get turned off to your survey by difficult questions or boring questions. You want to arrange them so that you get their interest. As soon as they start to work, they can say, aha, that's interesting, or that's not too difficult. And also, you want to end with demographics or other personal information that people might not want to share, especially if it's not uh, critical to your study. And most demographics aren't. There, you, if you haven't made a hypothesis about the demographics, it's okay if people leave them blank. So generally, we leave them at the end because it's human nature. People are going to get offended by something that you ask concerning uh, uh, demographics, and they might stop uh, the survey at that point. So it's better if they've already completed it uh, up to that point. Um, you also want to avoid order bias in response presentation. If you're giving a list of multiple choice things, you might want to randomize how they're presented, because if people don't know, they tend to choose either the first or the last. Um, so um, most survey tools have a randomization option if you if they have to choose from a, a list. Um, so so use that. So it's not always the same uh, 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 options in the choices in the positions people most likely are to choose. And then ask general questions before specific ones. It's called the funnel technique. You start off broad and then go to the narrow questions. You ask, are you happy with your life before? Are you happy with your marriage? Because if you get people focused on their marriage, they'll use what they've been thinking about there to emphasize or to, th to evaluate their life. But if you start with their life in general, they'll think about the things that are the most important to them. And maybe the question of marriage is not uh, uh, that important, especially if they're uh, uh, single. So start with the broad and go towards the, uh, the narrow. Now, the physical layout of the survey, how, when you're doing Google Scholar or using some other op, what do you start with? Well, you start off with a good title that's interesting. It says basically what the study's about, but you don't want to indicate what your hypothesis is. You don't want to influence people. Most people who take your survey are going to like you, and if they know what you're looking for, they're going to be motivated to give you what you want. So don't be too specific in the title or in any of the, the descriptions. In the introduction, that first paragraph, you want to start off with a warm greeting, positive, encouraging. You want to explain broadly what the purpose of the study is. You don't want to give away your hypothesis, but if you want to do this to help organizations function better, something like that, or for leaders to have a more positive influence on people, something like that, be clear what the purpose is. They can know that they're making a contribution. So you, you're basically appealing to self-interest with this. You want to communicate what participants will get out of it. Now, you might want to put it on something like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, where you pay people a dollar or two to fill out the survey. Um, that would, uh, that's a legitimate way to get data. And the responses that you get, um, different studies have shown that um, they're, it's just as good as a convenient sample, at least, maybe better. So uh, um, in that case, you would need to explain that they're getting paid for it. But uh, otherwise, most people just want to participate because they want to help you out, because they want to help organizations, they want to do good to other people in general, and then how long it will take, um, which can vary immensely depending on people's personalities. Um, some people will go through 80 questions in five minutes, others will spend um, a half hour on it and have an ex existential crisis as they think about things that they've never thought about before. In general, give the best case scenario, because people generally go really fast. The person that spends a half hour on it is more of the exception. Um, typically, there'll be a lot of people that go uh, under five minutes. And then you want to provide information on anonymity, letting them know that it'll be anonymous, and also generally 
there has to be an informed consent where they're informed that they don't have to participate in this and they can stop anytime that they want and they uh, um, uh, they understand that it'll be anonymous. So once you get past that first page and generally after the uh, informed consent says something like click next to give your informed consent and then you they click on that and they go to page two and that's where the different items start that they respond to and you need to provide clear instructions for each section say exactly what they're supposed to do they uh, like indicate how much you agree with each of the following statements or think of your co-workers uh, how would you uh, rate the quality of your relationship with them using these words that follow something like that be real specific and clear in the instructions for each section use grids especially with likert items where you have all the uh, prompts all the the statements on the the left side and then they've got columns for strongly disagree disagree neither agree nor disagree agree strongly agree and have maybe 10 items in a a grid people can go through those really fast and they and they like doing that um, do as many likert and fixed alternative questions as you can because they're quick easy and effective um, if you're using a scale that has two endpoints um, uh, good or bad try using the same endpoints all the way through the um, uh, the survey that helps people it makes it less confusing and make sure always the the bad or the disagrees on the left and the good or the strongly agrees on the the right because it's more natural that way um, use a lot of white space so it doesn't look um, uh, dense and hard to follow um, use a status bar that's a little bar that fills up as they go through the pages um, if you think it's going to be useful, do that. A lot of times if there's skip logic, it's not very accurate, so you might not want to use it if skip logic is involved. You need to proofread the test super carefully. And if you have skip logic, that'll cause certain questions to be skipped if people don't meet uh, certain requirements. Like if they haven't had at least two kids, they shouldn't ask, be asked to compare their pregnancies. Um, and um, so test out the skip logic and also test out the randomization if you if you have some uh if there's some items you're randomizing people's uh, responses for make sure it works perfectly um radio buttons and check uh check boxes are good um where people just check what they is true drop down boxes are bad they're really hard for people people make a lot of mistakes so avoid the drop down boxes and minimize the use of open-ended questions where people have to type in some response and type out a sentence or a paragraph they just don't like that and they won't finish the survey um, unless they're extremely motivated 